Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Uh, 20 years of Journey Home programs have reminded me of something unique about the way the Holy Spirit works in our life because we are each unique people with unique journeys, uh, unique needs, and uh, maybe the programs over all these years have shown us that the Holy Spirit does work with each of us in unique ways. Uh, and I particularly have been drawn to uh, from these programs to know the importance of humility and being able to respond to how the Holy Spirit works in our lives to draw us closer to our Lord and to His church. And so I, every week I pray that these programs are an encouragement to you. Our guest tonight is Lila Marie Lawler, a former for one church, for, for want of a better title. Uh, Lila, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. It's good to have you here. Uh, I guess I should say finally have you here because when you and I met a number of years ago, I had, at the time, I just finished reading your book, The Little Oratory, which I strongly recommend, A Beginner's Guide to Prayers in the Home. And I know you've had a chance to discuss this on Doug Keck's bookmark and, and Jim and Joy. And so some of the EWTN audience might all already be familiar with your work, but welcome to The Journey Thank Home. Thank you. It's good to have you here. Let me shut up and get out of the way and uh, invite you to take us way back and let's hear your journey. Well, I think it, when I explain to people how it is they became a Christian, I always like to remind them that maybe they remember growing up in a household where Jesus Christ was mentioned or where there was some worship or whether they celebrated Christmas or some part of the faith was handed on to them. They were baptized, but none of that was true for me. Hmm. I grew up in a very highly secularized, progressive place. Um, my father was, an, he was Egyptian, he was a Muslim, and in, at that time, the uh, Muslims who were here were highly trained professionals, so he was a professor of engineering. He had had a very westernized education, so he considered himself to be a a secular humanist, he considered himself to be a refined, educated, upright person who knew a lot about science and was not interested in religion, thought that religion was superstitious, but his background was Muslim. For him was becoming westernized, westernized a purging of that religious path I in think a way. that today we don't realize that um, the Muslim world has become extremely fundamentalized and that back in the 50s, I was born in 1960, back in the 50s um, when he was in school, it was especially in Egypt in it, where he went to school in Alexandria and Cairo, it was very cosmopolitan. The mm. upper classes had mm. went to very um, Western schools, either you went to an English school, a French school, a German school, you spoke those languages. From the beginning, there was a very secular idea of progressiveness, mm -hmm. of getting the good things in this life. At that time, no woman even wore a headscarf. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was just a very different, we've almost lost touch with the historical fact, which is that um, unlike what we're used to, which is that the idea that things start out fundamentalist and yeah. become um, somewhat more moderate, that is not the case that we're looking at now with the mm -hmm. Middle Eastern world. So anyway, that's just the background yeah. that we're talking so about a very, behind, yeah. he, oh, it wasn't even there. So yeah. it, yeah. he was a very cosmopolitan person. He studied in, in um, Hungary and then he studied in, he actually studied here in Ohio. <laughs> he went to Ohio State, then he went to Cornell. So he was very much, um, a very well-educated, sophisticated mm -hmm. person of um, very mild and scientific ideas, but his temperament was strong. And uh, <laughs> and he met my mother, and my mother, I like to say, was a fallen, fallen away Methodist. She's now a really good, devout Catholic. Um, but at the time, she was someone who had fallen away from her Methodist upbringing and she had gone to the city, and during the late 50s, she had become a person very much involved in the more psychological views of life that, you know, it's all about 
being happy and finding happiness and in a sort of psychological kind of a way. So anyway, they met, they had me, um, they were married and they had me, and they divorced when I was very young. Mm -hmm. So um, it's hard for me to explain to people because now you look at me, I kind of have a lot of white hair. <laughs> <laughs> but the world that I lived in was so progressive. Since my father was a university professor, I lived in New Haven, Connecticut. The schools that I went to, the but public schools. When your schools, parents separated, they, sep they were divorced, and I was. Um, with your father? I was with your, my mother. Your mother, okay. Although my father was a very big presence in my life mm -hmm. until um, later when I was an older teenager. But mm -hmm. um, the divorce was mm -hmm. extremely decisive to my well-being mm -hmm. and I was very unhappy mm -hmm. because my life fell apart with yeah. my parents' divorce. At the same time, the world that I was living in in the early 60s in New Haven was a very progressive world. Mm -hmm. It was a world where all the theories, which we think of, I see people talking about these things as, oh, these things kind of happened in the 90s. No, in the 60s, mm -hmm. people were trying to go into the schools. They were trying to remove all traces of mm -hmm. Religion, prayer, all those things, maybe out in the heartland, those things still obtained, but in a place like New Haven, Connecticut, the progressives were reigning. So yeah. there was no, um, there were vestiges, and I'll talk about that, but things were in turmoil as well because politically, um, I think you're probably the same age as I am then. <laughs> you remember that there were the Bobby Seal, you know, the riots, the trial. There were the, all those yeah. racial riots that were happening in the yeah. 60s, um, the Vietnam War. So I was kind of in a kind of a pressure cooker of yeah. a lot of philosophical change, a lot of cultural change, and a lot of real turmoil riots happening two streets away from me. I'm just a little girl. And to me, those external things mirrored something that was going on in my psyche and in my soul. Yeah. And in your family, which and is in breaking my family. apart. You know, the old, the old image of a, a piece of cloth begins fraying at the edges. Mm -hmm. But this was ripping down. Well, I was going to say, that, that was our country at the time. Yes. Well, many people might, might say 80s and 90s, but it was fraying at the edges on the east and the west coasts. Mm -hmm in the 60s is your time where you were living out there yeah. in Connecticut. So all that's happening in the culture at the same time, your, fam your family and yourself are fraying. Fraying, no, no, I mean, no family, extended family to step in and give any guidance. You know, my father has left his family behind there in Egypt. Um, so he's completely an independent actor. My mother um, consciously leaving behind her family to live this you know, much more sort of open to these new ideas. And so for me, my lifeline as a little child was, it's going to sound funny, but it was really the fairy tales. My father was very, because he loved books and he was considered himself an intellectual, he always was very careful to give me beautiful books. So I had a lot of fairy tales. I had a lot of the beautiful stories that have now disappeared, but were then um, very carefully, I think, handed on to children. So I had that. And at the same time, my mother had purchased an entire set of the Chronicles of Narnia, which had just come out. So I had the Chronicles of Narnia, and she started reading them to me, actually. I can still remember as a little girl sobbing and sobbing when Aslan died, and I wouldn't let her finish. And she tried to tell me that it would be all right, and I could not let her finish. It was too much for me. <laughs> but you have to understand, I feel like most people, many people who would be watching this might say, but you knew what happened at the end of that story because you knew the story of Jesus Christ, but I didn't. Yeah. I had never been told the gospel. I had never known that story. I had never read it. I had never been to church, so I didn't know it. Hmm. So and that I, was very devastating I was to me. I, I don't think when I read the books, I knew that Lewis was Christian, and I knew that that was the background. I wonder what it would have been like to read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and have no clue no that clue. there 
I didn't understand the resurrection. I had no inkling of it. And I knew eventually I did force myself when I learned to read. I forced myself to read them. And it was kind of a harbinger of this, this thread that's in me, which is to make myself pursue whatever it is, however uncomfortable I have to pursue it. I did make myself read it, and then I went on to read the other books. I knew there was something transcendent here, but this is to tell you how impoverished the spiritual part of my life was. I was not sure. I thought Aslan could be God or he could be the president. <laughs> Just a little sad. <laughs> so, um, so here I am. This is the forming my imagination. These stories are forming my imagination. My parents' love of beauty is forming my imagination. But there's a huge kind of schizophrenic divide because at the same time, there's a lot of bad influences coming into my life, a lot of confusion and a lot of disorder and a lot of ugliness mm -hmm. because it was a time when people were consciously moving away from the traditional idea of beauty and embracing real ugliness. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of emotional ugliness for me. So that's kind of where I was. And the confusion was really very, almost, I would say, almost complete to the point that mm. emotionally, psychologically, I was really in turmoil. And that I consider to have a real philosophical underpinning mm. really comes down to the idea of being. Because if you're taught, as I was taught, that your being is self generated, that you are who you want to be, and that you can be whatever you want to be, that there's no givenness to who you are, that's profoundly um, detaching from reality. And that has a psychological, hmm. ram has psychological ramifications. So it, ironically, it leaves you completely open to the elements, literally, so to the point that if you happen to be the kind of person who low pressure affects you, you know the kind of thing where you is the low pressure front is moving in and you kind of get a headache. That's that's how I am. That's how I am, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, on a day like that where it was raining and there'd be low pressure, I had no sense of self worth because my sense of self worth was based on however I felt. Mm -hmm. And this is what people don't understand when they make everything about feelings. They don't understand that for a child. Your feelings come and go. So some days, if I woke up and happened to have enough sleep and the sun was shining, I felt OK. If it happened not to be that way, or something bad was happening, or somebody said a bad word to me, or somehow disturbed me, I had nothing to fall back on. So there was a lot of distress in my life. But I always had the books that I had been given. I always had that. The other thing I like to say um, to remind people of is that one thing that progressives or people who like to want to undermine Christianity, they didn't realize right off the bat that they needed to address the educational system and the content of the educational system. They contented themselves with telling children a lot of things that weren't true, but they left a lot of the books and the process of education in place. Mm -hmm. And I was the recipient of that, so I did have a lot of things that today they have since learned. And so now they've, there's been a process, and I would say that that did occur in the 90s. That, Eventually it did um, spurge from it. Purge, yeah. Yeah. Purging yeah. the educational system so that there isn't even a book that mm -hmm. you would have recourse to that would give the light, shine the light. So I did have that. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that I noticed as I got older and by this time, my mother and I had moved to Princeton, New Jersey. And your mother's influence, just to get this right, that whenever you would think whether there might be a spiritual reality, her influence would say that's psychological. She did have a very psychological way of looking at things. And the milieu that I was in basically ascribed to all of the desires that a person has a sexual meaning. So the Are idea you, that, yeah. you know, which is meant to be free so that we can express ourselves the way we want to, but primarily in a sexual way. That that's where okay. that, you know, greatest, I mean, it's understandable because the 
the sort of greatest, and we are sexual creatures in a way made male and female, our bodies have a nuptial meaning. So there it is, um, and of course, our sexuality also mirrors some very important realities about God's love for his church, his fecundity, all those things that I later learned. But this idea that is prevalent and was very prevalent then, and I think continues to be very prevalent, that it's all about releasing yourself from all these, um, the rigidities, <coughs> the rigidities and the, the, the oppression of the structures which just completely prevent you from expressing yourself, from having free love, and from expressing yourself and finding contentment that way. Now, my mother also is a person who loves beauty and also does have a certain common sense. So there were some things she always um, viscerally reacted to certain things in a way that, that helped me. But I would say that she too was a victim of you know, the divorce culture, the, all these things. So the two of us are making our way um, kind of continuing in this kind of agnostic way and I mean not caring about religion basically seeing it as repressive um, superstitious all those things we moved to Princeton but I continued to have an education that was both in some ways grounded in the classics and mm -hmm. the great works of literature and ideas of the past but also very progressive so very schizophrenic so um, and various things were happening in my life. One of the things that was happening was that as one does when one reads, has loved some books yeah. from long standing, one says, well, let's go to the library and find something written by that author that I would also maybe be interested in. I just needed something to read, so I went to the library. I was maybe 15 at the time. and. Um, went to C.S. Lewis, found where there were his other works, found Mere Christianity, and began to read that. Now, I think that probably you have a lot of guests <laughs> say that they read Mere Christianity and that really helped them along their journey. And one of the things in that book that helped them was Lewis basically putting very starkly, you have to confront the reality of Jesus Christ that you know, it's not just that he was an okay, wonderful guy like the other okay, wonderful guys with a lot to teach us. Either he's crazy or he's who he says he is. Well, that is not the part that got me because <laughs> I did not know anything about Jesus Christ. I knew you that he was. You know what he said about himself. <laughs> I knew he was born on Christmas Day. I did not know about the cross, the death, the suffering. I did not know about the resurrection. I did not know about any of that. For me, what mere Christ Christianity did for me was to express in simple terms what the natural law is and that there exists outside of myself something that is unchanging and against which unconsciously I'm always measuring my ideas of something being better or worse or not right, all those things that he talks about. Furthermore, there's another section in Mere Christianity where he very, very subtly and very almost in passing addresses all the things that I struggled with that um, or that be had become the furniture of my mind. The idea, for instance, that the fall, that the, the um, the popular imagination slash progressive mentality ascribes to the fall a sexual meaning that Adam and Eve were somehow prevented from knowing about their sexuality and the fall represents their attainment of sexuality. And he almost in passing and parenthetically says, but this is, is a mistake because actually it seems that the sexual part of it is a result of the fall and the fall is actually about something much more elemental, much bigger than sexuality. And that really hmm. struck at the basis of what I had been taught up until then. And then he goes on to mention other things. He, he has a whole chapter about psychology. So he's talking about um, whether you know, it's true that simply pursuing our own feelings of pleasure are going to be the things that are going to make us happy. So he's addressing all these things about the secular humanist culture, particularly the one precept 
that I have been most inured with, which is you can do whatever you want to do as long as you do not harm anyone else. This is the creed of secular humanism. Mm -hmm. This is what I was taught by my parents, unfortunately, by my schooling, by the people around me. Do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anyone else. Lewis takes this and demolishes it because he says there's so much more to morality than that. Mm -hmm. And the two other aspects besides just how we deal each with each other, harmony, fairness, and justice, the two other aspects are what is within each person, which I had never confronted, mm -hmm. and what is the ultimate goal towards which all this moral activity is tending. So around this time, I want to just make sure uh, that I mention, uh, besides the fact that I remind the audience that I guess of Lila Murray, that you really emphasize something I also want to about C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. It isn't primarily an apologetic about Jesus Christ. It's primarily more what you're talking about. It deals with the, the secular cultures, idealisms that it's bought into, and he slowly addresses that. And, and, the, and yes, the, the apologetic reality. for Jesus Christ is a part of that, yes. but it's really what you're talking about, the it natural is. law and the necessity. Which the natural law, the idea that there's a given standard outside yeah. of myself, and that gives me my definition, so it doesn't matter whether it's raining or sunny, this thing is unchanging. This was huge for me, huge. Now at this time you have to realize, I'm a feminist, I'm super, super open to all sorts of things. I'm very um, pro-abortion, <clears throat> and I meet, I'm just like a kid in high school who has all the dumb opinions that kids in high school have because <laughs> adults in their lives are simply churning them out and they're just accepting them. Every teacher, every person you meet, every book magazine you read, I read Ms. Magazine. Um, and at the same time, I had met this fellow who was to later become my husband. He's 10 years older than I am, so he's a young man. He lost his hair very early on, so I did not, I'm like, oh, the bald guy, you know, like I didn't consider him to be, you know, wasn't romantic at all when we met. He worked in the same office as my mother. He was a j journalist and she was the secretary, and it was a very conservative um, magazine at Princeton University. And um, it, it's, it's just funny because politically I was very conservative, but in all other ways I was very liberal. So here's this guy, and he was on his own journey. Maybe someday you can ask him. He was Catholic, and he was coming back to the Catholic Church, um, and, that, and he went to daily mass, and my mother told me that. And it was kind of like, he must be really repressed if he's going <laughs> to mass every day. <laughs> And I think we're going to pause there. We'll, we'll have it there and come back to. We need to take a break, and uh, it'll be interesting to to uh, to hear more about. Uh, I mean, first of all, it's an amazing work of grace that that Mary Christianity awakened you from what you were, yeah. but also to be open to to this man in your in your mother's office. So yeah. we'll come back to that in a little bit. Our guest is Lila Murray Lawler. We'll be back in a moment to continue her story. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Lila Marie Lawler. She's the author of The Little Oratory, which is available uh, EWTN's uh, catalog. And also, um, she has a website, likemotherlikedaughter.org, in case you want to find out more about what she does. So let's pick it up uh, where I rudely interrupted you a <laughs> moment ago. You were just talking about you, you've met this guy who's a Catholic. This guy was a Catholic and also the smartest person I had ever met. <laughs> so, you know, that's a challenge because here's somebody really smart, but you know he goes to daily mass and that just does not seem right. Um, <laughs> well, anyway, one time I did get into an argument with him about abortion and I was just saying, you know, what well, don't you see all the reasons why? Very important that women have this right, et cetera, et cetera, give all the talking points. And the thing you have to know about my husband, unlike me, he does not, he's not actually that interested in arguing. And he just <laughs> kind of said, yeah, but it's just wrong. Mm 
And I had never heard anybody say that about something that I thought was important. It's just wrong. <laughs> and I was kind of fed up with him, and he wouldn't argue, and he wouldn't engage. He just kept saying, it's, it, it's just wrong. And I went home, and I really had an epiphany because I really said, there are some things that are just wrong. Now, at this time, I had a, a friend who had gone pregnant, and it's really rather sordid because her parents allowed her to go out with this guy who was just not at all a respectable person. They allowed the person into her mm -hmm. their home. They allowed him into her, her room. They were very progressive. They didn't allow him to spend the night, but she got pregnant, and then they took her to have an abortion. And to me, that was just you know, there is a problem and you have a solution. Yeah, and yeah. that seemed fine to me and I thought it was great and that was part of the background, the baggage that I had when I was talking to this young man and I was kind of like, yeah, well, we were very, very close friends and here's another incredible thing that hmm. happened was that the reality was that she was devastated it was not a question of anybody was making her feel bad about it. Her own parents took her. It was all great and fine and just the way it should be in terms of everyone supporting her. I certainly mm -hmm. saw nothing wrong about it. She told me that it hurt like hell, mm -hmm. that she was devastated. She knew it was the right thing to do. and. Every time we got together, she was in tears. After a few months had gone by, she started saying, my baby would be three months old. It was un incredible to me. Mm. This challenged everything I had thought. Mm. The reality was that something life-changing and death-dealing had happened to her. And I had to take that reality and bring it into line with my thoughts. And when this person said to me, this young man said to me, it's just wrong, I had to say, that corresponds to what I'm observing, mm. that something really wrong has happened here. So I don't even, I can't even, things were in such chaos, I can't even look back and say, say, first I read this, then this happened, you know, I can't even say that. All I can say is that um, these things were happening and that they were challenging me and I was having to question everything that I knew, but at the same time, the inkling that there was something outside of myself that was unchanging and that possibly was very benevolent was making me feel a lot of joy. Now, at this time, as I told you in the high school that I went to, we still read many very good works. Hmm. And it was very interesting to me, by now I'm about 16, um, going maybe s almost, yeah, 16, and I had a very good English teacher who was actually a secular Jew. He taught us all the Shakespeare and all the, you know, Moby Dick and all the great works of literature. And he always said, so this, is this allusion in the Old Testament? Who knows what this is? But of course, in the public school, you were never allowed to read the Bible. You were never allowed to talk about the Bible. One day in class, we were reading a poem of Emily Dickinson, and she mentions Calvary. And he says, does anybody know what that term refers to, Calvary? And here we are, a bunch of, I mean, this is in Princeton, it's all professors, students, you know, children, it's all, you know, elite, yeah. super educated, high-powered kids who went off to Harvard and Yale and whatever. And only one girl knew what this referred to, and she was the evangelical Christian in our class. We all knew that she was the evangelical Christian. We all looked <laughs> down on her because the poor thing was so benighted and so um, somehow wrapped up with this superstitious worldview, and yet she's the only one who knew the answer to an intellectual question, a question about literature, a question that was actually crucial to knowing what this poem was about. <laughs> she's the only one who knew. So. This struck me as ridiculous. How can it be that you're studying works 
trying to delve to the meaning of them and nobody's allowing you to find out what is the key to the meaning. I actually kind of got mad and I went home and I said, that's it. I don't care. I'm reading the Bible. So of course, my mother being a good fallen away Methodist had a Bible. <laughs> And I, again, everything's so confused, I can't even tell you how I knew that where to begin at the New Testament. I opened up that afternoon, I opened up the Bible to the book of Matthew. I sat down and I read the book of Matthew. As a purely intellectual exercise to do better <laughs> in my studies, and when I got to the end, I believed. <laughs> Work of grace. It is. Could I tell you what? No, my point I, is not merely intellectual. No, not merely grace intellectual. Of, there is something. That the, I will say that looking back at this girl who now is very, you know, far from me, I can say I did have an openness to the truth. I was willing to pursue whatever. At you know, even if I knew that I would be devastated, I had to go to the bottom of it. So. What was I ascending to? I could not really tell you. Hmm. The, the phrases that stuck, stuck out in my mind were, ask and it will be answered to you, knock hmm. and it will be opened to you. I think the Sermon on the Mount hmm. maybe stuck out to me. I, I can't even tell you. I got to the end and I just said, whatever this is, it fits into this world, this home that I have and that I've had recourse to so many times in the turmoil of my childhood, the world of Narnia, the world of Tolkien, the world of the fairy tales. You know, fairy tales are very much the sort of, if there's a shorter catechism, fairy tales I think of as the shorter gospel, the sort of the seed that has to die before it will bear fruit, the, the idea of... Um, of the, the good and the true being hidden. So this shorter gospel, or this, this little hidden gospel, which I had carried around, this real gospel fit with that. And that's all I knew. So I began talking to this fellow. Your frog prince? My frog prince. <laughs> the out fellow of the fairy, out of the fairy tales, exactly, <laughs> who was willing to talk to me about everything. I would go after school. You know, when your parents are divorced, you go to your mom's office. You don't go home. There's nobody at home. So I went to her office. It was just, I could walk there, and I just sat and did my homework in her office. After a while, I started doing my homework in Phil's office. And uh, he was always, he does his work really fast, so he was always willing to be distracted by me. And I, I began talking to him about some of these things. And he said, you know, well, if you like C.S. Lewis, you're going to like uh, G.K. Chesterton. <laughs> and he handed me orthodoxy. And of course, in orthodoxy, there's the chapter, The Ethics of Elfland, which bring together these two strands of the natural law, or this law that is somehow outside of ourselves, to which we are adverting whether we realize it or not, and this fairyland world where the wonder and the joy of the world as it is is so magical to us that we don't have to m make any other crazy things. That in itself is enough. So I, I read Orthodoxy. And uh, he said, well, if you like G.K. Chesterton, you're going to like Thomas Aquinas. Now, I'm 16 years old, and he's giving me Thomas <laughs> Aquinas to read, and I read it. I mean, I read certain things that he gave me. I can't remember exactly what he gave me. I read certain questions and answers, and I, and I thought, this is order. This is, this is, I mean, I can't even understand this, but it's so amazing. It's it just to me seemed so true mm. and the truth to me was just what I needed. I needed the truth and mm. without realizing it all my life that's what I had been seeking. So we had all these conversations, talked about all these things and one day he said to me, you know, um, we should go to, you should go to church. You should go to, I know this minister who I think you would really like. So at this time, not to tell someone else's story, but he was going to daily mass, but he was not going to mass on Sunday. 
he was going to the Princeton University Chapel to listen to, I don't know if you're familiar with, um, at the time the dean of the chapel was Ernest Gordon, have you ever heard that no. name? Yeah. And he was a man who found his faith in the prison camps of Japan in the Second World War. Yeah. He was a, he called himself a Scottish playboy. He was in the Navy, he was captured. He found himself in this officer's prison camp. He was dying, he was put in the hut for the dead. Um, you've, I'm sure people have seen the movie, um, The Bridge Over the River Kwai. Mm. Dean Gordon's book is called Through the Valley of the Kwai. He was there mm. and he became a Christian when some men who were there shared their pitiful rations. They, they crawled into this hut for the dead and the dying. He was laid out there next to the corpses and they shared their rice with him. And he said to them, why are you doing this? And they said, because of Jesus Christ. And then they shared with him. So he became a Christian. And what he realized through all this incredible thing that he went through and what he shared at the Princeton University Chapel was that man had succumbed to relativism and had lost the idea of the truth, that there exists a truth. And when he left the camp, he said, my mission is going to be to preach the truth, mm. that there exists absolute truth. But here's me, little me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the gospel that I needed. I needed to hear that there is the truth and that you have to detoxify yourself from this life of relativism, that everything depends on you, that you create your own reality. It takes a long time. It's a long process. So we went to hear him. He preached. So I mean, he was the dean of the chapel at Princeton University. His, his sermons were very intellectual, very erudite, and they were always about Jesus Christ being the ground, how man comes to know that there exists an absolute truth. So after we'd gone there for a while, my soon, someday to be husband says to me, and we still didn't really realize this ourselves, <laughs> he, we were just really good friends, and he says to me, you, you probably should be baptized. So I said, well, how would I go about doing that? <laughs> he said, well, you should talk to Dean Gordon. So I talked to Dean Gordon. He talked to me. He was a talker. <laughs> and I sat with him many days across a desk, just as you and I are sitting. And he instructed me on the Christian faith. And he baptized me on October 23rd, 1977. So I'm coming up on um, my 30th anniversary hmm. of being a Christian. And he baptized me into the church. So he was a Presbyterian, oh, but he believed yeah. very much in the church hmm. and as the dean of the chapel he tried to keep things you know somewhat ecumenical or whatever you would call it so non-denominational non-denominational exactly exactly so i was baptized as a christian and um then i think both phil and i began to actually go a little further along the what is the church that we're actually looking for. Um, and the time went by and we started to, I said to um, uh, Dean Gordon at one point, as my baptism time came closer, I said, you know, Phil and I are we're thinking about that, you know, I'm getting to be 17 and I'm saying, if we're thinking that maybe we would get married. And he's like, oh yes, I know. <laughs> so, oh really, do you? So anyway, but that was a long way off still, but we were doing things together and my husband-to-be was also looking to see where is, and he said to me, there's something missing at that university service. I was like, something missing? What's missing? I mean, there's beautiful hymns, there's the gospel, there's a wonderful sermon, it's very beautiful, the chapel is very beautiful, yeah. and I don't know what, what it is that you think we're, you're missing. We had also started going to Evensong, which was held at the chapel, and the Episcopal um, group had, had, I don't know if they still have it, but they had a beautiful, traditional Evensong service. Mm -hmm. And for me, this was my entry into a real liturgical mm -hmm. life, which is so striking to me that that seed was planted so long ago, I did not know anything in the ensuing years really about the liturgy of the hours, or I only knew the vaguest things, but for me, 
that is worship. The liturgy of the hours is worship. Evensong is, of course, Vespers, and the prayers of Vespers, the beautiful chant of the Magnificat mm -hmm. was decisive for me, but it's in English. They chant it in the old English chant that was really decisive to me for opening up the liturgical world, the world of Our Lady, the world of that there exists this ongoing worship that we simply participate in and enter into. So we began to look around, and he said, well, let's go to the Episcopal. So in, in so he Princeton, was he was exploring. Himself. So I have a friend who says they were up to Episcopal. So, so yeah. uh, the darling little Episcopal church in Princeton, it's perfect. It's beautiful. It's charming. It's just everything a church should be. And we went in there, and you know, it was beautiful. The music was beautiful, and it was nonsense. It was just nonsense. I mean, I hate to say it, but it was all celebration of self. We were just, we were kind of laughing and saying, well, this isn't it. So, so you then. Mean that particular. That particular one, one was just, and at that time, right. okay? So we have to understand yeah. that this is the 70s where if you were going off the rails liturgically, you were going way off the rails. Right. And it was a, you know, prancing around the altar and really celebrating the self and who we are and how wonderful we are. And it, there was nothing yeah. there for us. So, but I will tell you something when you say that particular church. At that moment, I turned to Phil and I said, someday, was after the moment when we were talking about that and he was saying, I think I just need to go back to the Catholic Church. And they said, someday I am going to celebrate in a church that is an Episcopal congregation that became Catholic. Well, flash forward 25 years, this actually did happen because in St. <laughs> Mary's in Dedham, right. where we lived, um, not to jump around, but we lived in St. Mary's in Denham with our, at the time, six children, and the congregation on the East Coast that was discerning to become Catholic was in the convent chapel of St. Mary's. And when we found ourselves worshiping with them, I turned to my husband and I said, see, I told you that one day this would be what I would have. And we did actually worship them with them for quite a while. So at this point, now time has gone on. I'm getting, starting to um, think about college. I went off to college for uh, my freshman year. And during that time, we decided we would marry. And um, he had told me, he had said, you don't have to become Catholic because I'm Catholic. But as soon as I had ever read Chesterton and Aquinas and then <laughs> had seen that there was something missing. What was this thing that was missing in the, this basically high Presbyterian worship that we did at the chapel? And I said, what is it that's missing? And he said, well, the Eucharist. I didn't even know what that meant. I didn't know. I was like, well, he's like, yeah, once a month to pass around, you know, the grape juice and the bread, that's not, that's not it. And I was like, really? Big, well, what is? What are you talking about? <laughs> then the Episcopal, well, there was something not quite right there. And then, unfortunately, there, there just was a lot of liturgical confusion in the Catholic Church at that time at in time. that place. So it was very hard to find um, what it was. But once having decided, I knew that this was, I had to become a Catholic. Mm -hmm. I had to go. I think in Mere Christianity, Lewis says, God, reality is much odder than you think it is. And I think mm -hmm. actually he, without realizing it, is saying something about Mere Christianity, this idea that he has that somehow you can distill something that would appeal to everyone. And I think actually it's, it's almost like a, a challenge to him that no, you're going to go deeper in, and it's going to be odder than you think, and more particular than you think, and that is where I knew I was headed. So actually, um, I, I had instruction with the priest who was the chaplain at, at uh, I did not attend Princeton, I went to Swarthmore College, but uh, I just was friends with people there, and um, the priest there gave me instruction, and 
I mean, he was very he was very confused, and the instruction that he gave me was not clear instruction. But somehow I I pers persevered, and two weeks before we were married, I did enter the Catholic Church. But I always say I wasn't because of him. I would have even if I were going to not marry him. <laughs> and uh, and then two weeks later we were married, and that's when I realized, when the children came, I realized. I have I am not even a beginner. I'm not even up to beginner, <laughs> and only you know the journey of learning, I mean, coming from nowhere, learning about the Bible, learning mm. about the faith, learning about everything, learning about virtue, which really, if it doesn't start when you're young, it takes a long time mm -hmm. to figure that out. So that's an ongoing process. Mm. So all of that, yeah, that is, that is basically my journey. Our guest is uh, uh, Lila Marie Lawler. It's interesting, um, today when people are entering the church, we've We've come out of the confusing time in many, many ways. You know, we have a catechism. We, mm -hmm. you know, uh, right, the catechism is amazing. That wasn't there for you at the I time. I was handed the Dutch catechism. Which, which was is, a goofy one. Which yeah. was a goofy one. And basically, this priest who since left the priesthood said to me, you're smart, you can read this. So there was no, yeah. there was no give and take. There was no, so it was a very confusing time. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was wondering. Was you, if you look back, what was it in time that uh, brought both you and your husband, Phil, uh, to wade through all that confusion to find the trueness, the, you know, the true diamond in the midst of what was becoming a rough at the time, not because of Vatican II, but by the way it was applied. And yeah. I'd say there were a couple of things. One thing was that I, I just mentioned in passing that we were politically very conservative, and I think conservatism at that time was a very a, a movement, you know. You had um, Bill Buckley, you had Russell Kirk, you had a lot of very intelligent, well-formed people, who whose political interests were grounded in causes. So they were concerned with the causes of things. Mm -hmm which ultimately goes back to reality. What is the reality? How is it that people act? Not how would you like them to act? What is the fairy tale that you want them to live, like all sharing the goods together or whatever, but how do they actually act? How can you help them to act You know, for the common good? What is the common good? So a lot of the things, and this I, I really credit, You know, I mean, my mother actually with all the crazy theories that she was pursuing, she loved Bill Buckley, so there were good um, books in that way. Also, for instance, and this is the intellectual um, decay of our time when you realize that in those days, for instance, the Book of the Month Club mm. had amazingly good selections. So yeah, she belonged to the Book of the Month Club, and the books that were arriving in our house were Solzhenitsyn. <laughs> You know, I mean, Jane Austen, like truly worthwhile, very, yeah. very grounded books that either were culturally flourishing or were in some way intellectually demanding. And my um, husband's parents were very involved with, they were um, very interested in, for instance, supporting Thomas Aquinas College, so at that time, there were those initiatives where Catholics were coming together and saying, you know, we have to we have to really work, we have to do these initiatives to help people. They have to have a place to send their children to go to school. So we would get their they would get their publications and my husband would have them. Um, then at this time just my friend. So one amazing moment for me was National Review, for instance, published as a separate little booklet, Dorothy Sayers uh, the Lost Tools of Learning. When I, I had one time gone over to my friend Phil's apartment, we were gonna go to something at Princeton, and I looked over his coffee table, and here's Dorothy Sayers' Lost Tools of Learning. Oh, can I read that? So at this time, I'm kind of getting this informal education of in causes. Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, so then, you know, becoming Catholic, People were starting to, for instance, the National Catholic Register. There were there were columnists in that m newspaper, which um, Phil did get, who were 
decisive, they would just simply say, here's what the Catholic Church teaches about yeah. contraception. You're reading this column and you're saying, oh my goodness, I had no idea that this was the teaching. We have to, we have to follow this. We have to follow what the Church teaches. So people were really beginning that apostolate of, of uh, promoting the actual teachings of the Church. You uh, said so you were born in 60. You mm -hmm. came into church when you were 18 or 19? So I was 17 when I was baptized, and I was 19 when I entered the church. Which means that you became a Catholic about the same time John Paul II became Pope. So I was 79, yes, and then that was that year we got married, and he was Pope, and, um, and that was extraordinary as well. I was because then, that. Yeah, he began to proclaim the, he really, I think, understood that the secular culture had taken over because of his background, because of what he knew in the universities and everything. He was no longer, it was no longer a case of being kind of in your own world about what the, the world out there was like. He knew and he did cut through and people were excited and energized by that, yeah, for I mean, sure, yeah. Yeah, John Paul was, um, you know, uh, he spent the next four or five years after his becoming Pope, focusing on what we call life, the theology of the body. Right. But as soon as he finished that time, uh, his audiences began for 10 years a catechesis of the creed right. because he said this world needs a systematic catechesis. Yeah. He saw the need for uh, starting from scratch and bringing the whole world because of all that confusion that was going on. I'm wondering, uh, you wrote the little oratory, a beginner's guide to praying in the home, which you talked with Doug Keck on the bookmark and, and Jim and Joy. But h how was this book uh, kind of an outflow of your own journey? Well, David Clayton is my co-author, and he and I agreed that this is the book we wished we had had when we were starting hmm. um, our life as a Christian. There's a theologian, Jean Carbon, and he says, the question for the person is, how does life relate to liturgy? Hmm. How do I, as a Christian, now I have come to know that God is God and I must follow him, now what? How do I pray? How do I live my life? A question that you start to have children and you say, how am I gonna pass along the faith to my children? When you come to the church in this very intellectual way that I came, the mistake is that you think, I'll just explain it to them. And that's not the way. And it's also not the way to say, I'll just get a program. That's not the way either. What I came to know, but it took me a long time, and sadly, my poor children had to uh, be the little guinea pigs, and because so many of my friends, so many of the people I knew were in the same position of not having something to um, fall back on in terms of tradition. We had to really make things up ourselves and we made a lot of mistakes. But really, what it comes down to is you must live the liturgical life, you must live the liturgical year along with the church, and that has, happens in the home, and it's you live your faith and then your children live it with you. So yeah, you really it. Interesting. You uh, adjust yourself to the liturgy. To the liturgy is the teacher. And we put all that in the book. So yeah. the book is not something new. It's traditional. Yeah. And it has the, it, it's based, I call it a kit for, for having your own. We say that, that the, the place in the home, the little oratory, is the organizing principle, so you'll have this beautiful place in your home, and the beauty, the beauty of the life in the church, of the liturgical year, helps you to live your faith with your children, your own personal faith, your own personal prayer, and then with your children. It's uh, interesting to reflect on this being the 500th anniversary of the start of the Reformation. And in many ways, the Reformation was a flip-flopping of that, adjusting the liturgy, the, the liturgy to me. Mm -hmm. yes. I become the judge, the planner, to the point where maybe there's nothing there's left nothing. of any liturgy because I'm the one that decides how mm -hmm. I worship. Mm -hmm. But it exists, it's out there, all we do is we just, it's the river of 
life that w the tree is planted and its roots go deep into it. And this is the home, the connection between the home, the sacrament of marriage, and the Eucharist as it's celebrated in the church. There is a connection, and this oratory that we make in our home helps us. It's a, it's a physical, beautiful manifestation of the faith. And then organically and traditionally, we will learn. I only learned this later. And <laughs> so John, uh, David and I are like, well, yes, we wish we had had, but this is the book that we wish that we had. And I will tell the audience, it's a beautiful book, Thank and you. I encourage it's a little oratory. And if I want to find out more about it, it's available on EWTN catalog, but also uh, likemotherlikedaughter.org. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Ila, thank you very thank much you for so joining much. us on thank the program, you. and, and I, I pray that your book, as well as your story, encourages a lot of other folk on the journey. Thank, you, thank you. you. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do pray that Lila's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week. Thank you.